Well, it's uh, January 22nd. Uh, glad to be here. Uh, let's get right to it because, uh, as always, a lot to do. And uh, quickly, I listened to the Tate class from two weeks ago, and I can't believe I misspoke and talking about the percentage of the status quo. I said 10 or 15 percent. No way. I uh, even got the exact numbers. Uh, they're about, you see them in Hartman's book, uh, Patriots Without a Homeland. Uh, in 1930, um, neologs are 65%. Orthodox and status quo, orthodox are 30%. Status quo is 4%. So uh, you're talking, uh, you know, uh, a small percentage for status quo. So let me put this down here. Ah. This is uh, this is great. I also I I got the wrong uh, for Professor Steiner. I didn't exactly get the name of the book correct about the, the shin. The title of the book is I said the case for the fricative um, shin. It's actually fr the case for fricative laterals and proto semitic. That'll keep you up at night. Let me tell you. But it's quite interesting because as this is um, if you read the Jewish uh, link, this is Mitchell first. Uh, he's written. He's a lawyer, but he's written a number of interesting uh, things. He collects them into books as pieces. And mostly summarizing, but often giving his own scholarship. In fact, he wrote original scholarship about uh, the origin of Tiny Sester in the AGS Review, as well as other places. Uh, but in this article, he's just summarizing, and Steiner shows that originally, or argues, the shin, or the sin, the letter sin was pronounced S-L. And that explains how you have, um, like, Kastim, we have Kaldis, in some places it's pronounced in... In some documents, it's pronounced with an L. Uh, that's why it's Ur of the Caldees. If you ever wonder how Custine becomes Caldees. So that's Professor Steiner. I don't know if um, our friend Nissan is with us. But uh, Nissan? I am. I am. I, uh, there you are. So uh, here you go. Here's a good book on... Um, uh, you got the whole story there of Aguda and Poale, as well as I have uh, Binyamin Mintz's, uh the biography. And what I said was correct. Well, we both were sort of correct. But um, Poale Agudas Yisrael was distancing itself from Aguda in the 40s. But they never officially broke with them. They ran together with them. It wasn't until the fourth Knesset. In the 1950s also, they had uh, big conflicts. But they remained uh, together um, officially until this early 60s. And that's the fourth Knesset, as I recall. Then they broke. And that's when uh, they say all hell broke loose and uh, the stipler and uh, attacks on them and everything. So... Uh, Oh. And uh, uh, so that is correct. Uh, thank you to um, Moshe for pointing out that I made a mistake in uh, mentioning the name. The name I spoke about Sir Salanter's son, the one who died young, and I uh, I called him Yitzchak. Yitzchak is uh, is a son. I'll show you Yitzchak here. Here is Yitzchak. He's a Talmud Chacham. This picture of the Yitzchak at the bottom here has been identified mistakenly as Ravi Shal Salanter, and it's not. It's actually the son. But uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, saying that... Uh, no, no, sorry. The uh, um, the I, I spoke about the son who um, died young, yes. Uh, and uh, I'm confused now. Uh, the, he, yeah, the engineer. Okay, his name was Littman. Young Tov Littman. Litman was a shame called not Yitzhak like I said. This one is uh, Yitzhak. Now, incidentally, people I think will be interested that he had another son. Uh, they, uh, well, he had more than one other one. But he had a, the best, biggest Talmud Chacham of the sons of Yishol Salanter. His name isn't even, his name is Hervitz. Aryeh Leib Hervitz. He was a Rav of a city. You know, they took last names for all sorts of reasons. And here's a Sefer, Chaye Aryeh. So why do I mention this? Because if you look at the introduction, there's a two-page introduction to the Sefer, and it's signed at the end of it by who? His widow. Ela Divrei Almonas Hagona Machaber Zal Sara Elka Harvitz. Elka, that's another shame hole, I guess. Uh, 
Uh, women sometimes only had a shame chol. Like my grandmother's name was Genendel. She didn't have a Hebrew name because she wasn't called to the Torah. So she just had a shame chol. So I mean, on the one hand, this is really interesting because you can count on one hand and have a few fingers left, as far as I know, cases where uh, Yosef Zelger, Rabbi Yosef Zelger, his widow also has a hakdama, but she actually wrote it. Uh, she was a very, uh, like a masculine type of woman. But I don't think she wrote it. I just think some rabbi wrote it. If you look at the law shown in it, I have a feeling that um, there were women who could write it, but I have a feeling that some rabbi wrote the introduction and just signed her name. But notice she's not afraid to mention her name. Sarah Elkin Harvick is not like, to, and you'll give Rebheim Soloveitchik the invitations to his children's wedding. So he mentions his name and his wife's name. It's not like today in the Haredi world, has to to mention the wife's name. It's just, uh, they don't even mention the bride's name, but they mention uh, rabbi so-and-so and his wife invites you uh, to the wedding. So you see that the, uh, so different there. Oh, now I want to get to what I was asked about. Uh, quick, Yadid Nefesh. Because one of you asked, if you recall, we were speaking about uh, a few weeks ago, Yadid Nefesh. You know, if you look in the Siddur, it, at least in most Siddurim, it shows up, it's in Shal Shudas. Uh, but for whatever reason, it became a practice also to say it um, Erev Shabbos, uh, either be some people before Mincha, I think Svardim did it before Mincha, we do it uh, before, uh, but I mean, we didn't do it, it became a practice uh, before Kabbalah Shabbos, and among the modern Orthodox, it's pretty universal, in the Haredi world, not at all, in fact, someone that never even heard of this practice. Uh, so someone asks correctly, uh, what's the story with the um, uh, the different Chadodis? If you look, if you look in the um, the Koran Siddur, you see, it's not Chadodi, you see Nefesh. You see, Nefesh, it's not the same words that we have. I'll show you the words in a, few, in a minute. Um, if you look in the uh, Koran, not the Koran, the, uh, the new RCA sitter, you actually have both of them. On page in Kabbalah Shabbos, you have, before Kabbalah Shabbos, you have the Yadid Nefesh, we all know, know and love, I guess. And then in the back on page 1342, you have the... Um, the original, and they tell you that. In fact, we have the original Yadid Nefesh signed. I mean, in the signature, I have a copy of it here. I didn't put it on the screen now. Of um, Eliezer Azikri from the 16th century, a uh, Makubo. And uh, there's two different versions, and there's different words uh, in the versions. And now let me show you what I'm talking about here and explain to you something um, about this. Uh, where is it? I uh, brought it up. Uh, uh, here it is. Okay. Now, here it is. Okay. So, yes. So, you know one of the differences. So, uh, this is the version that um, is the actual version, which we don't sing. By the way, even though we sing uh, both Siduri, that is both versions, the common mistaken version and the uh, the true version, in this paragraph, it ends, although it's not chusa, it's uh, chusha in the original, but it's the alti salam. It's all alti salam, but everyone sings it that, like, here's the, the version that, um, why does everyone sing alti salam? It's alti salam. And it has to be, it rhymes. Ta'am, olam, ti salam, olam. That's because... Yes, in modern Hebrew, you say tisalem. Actually, in all Hebrew, you say or tisalem. But uh, in uh, rabbinic biblical Hebrew, it's it's a pausal. So at the end of the syllable, it'll end not lame, but lam. The problem is that in modern Hebrew, you don't have uh, a pausal. So everyone sings. So in shul, you should try to sing it correctly, tisalem. But uh, also notice here, it's the version we sing is ele hamdalibi. The original version is Ana Eli Mahmad Libi. Rav Mazuz actually suggests that this was not just a mistake, but someone changed it because Mahmad, that's how you say Muhammad. And uh, they didn't want to use the word Muhammad there, so they changed it. But um, so, first of all, it's strange that uh, now that we know the correct version, we don't recite it. We still say uh, the false version of it. Maybe you say because the song, it would be hard to get it in. Uh, I'm not sure. But uh, incidentally, I'm holding the um, um, Rina Sisral sitter here, which was a very influential sitter. And uh, 
the very Zionistic Seder, that has the uh, original version, the correct version. Now, let me show you probably uh, the major difference here. There's a few differences, but in this passage here, the high salach instead of the high salah, not simcha salam like we have, shifcha salam, and uh, that is that uh, a servant, uh, an eternal servant, and this is based on a pasuk in uh, Devarim, um, Eved Olam. Uh, that's really the big difference. But also, look how it is ours. We end it. Uh, but look in the original. And that continues. Um, now, um, as a pausal, the masculine, you can say avdach and retzonach. Uh, avdach is not really a pausal, it's in the middle, but uh, you can still you can still do it. And it's definitely it's masculine here. In fact, um, there's a problem in grammar in the um, in the the false version we say because um, where is it uh, here? I didn't have much of it. So oh, Hamdalibi, Ela Hamdalibi, Lave in Hebrew is always masculine. So that's uh, that's that's a mistake there. But what's going on? How do we know? If I I don't have it on a screen though, but if I would show you, and I could show you um, the actual text of the author, there's no nekudot, so you can read the words, and we know what the words are, and uh, the, how uh, you know we don't do it correctly, but uh, we don't know the vocalization. So how do I know? How does everyone know? that it's avdach, retzonach, and the next paragraph, uh, next line, sorry, yarutz avdach, kamalayal, yishtach avamul, hadarach, instead of uh, what we have it, yarutz avdacha, kamalayal, yishtach avamul, hadaracha. Well, that's because you have to know the rhyming here. And uh, this isn't yate tnuwa, like we spoke about in the past. Yate tnuwa, uh, the shvana doesn't count. This is just syllables. And each Unit here is eight syllables. So let's count them. Ye, did, ne, fesh, av, ha, rach, man. Notice it's not chatav uh, patach. Then, but even if it's chatav patach, it still would be considered one. Me, shoch, it's one, two, av, da, four, el, five, re, so, nach. If it was, uh, uh, if it was uh, retzonecha, that would make it nine syllables. So it messes everything up. All the paragraphs have to be, um, have to line up, not paragraphs, all the units have to line up with eight syllables. And if you uh, if you make it masculine, instead of avasach, it's avasecha, that adds, that messes up the uh, the whole thing here. Uh, let's see. Uh, ya, roots, av, dach, Ke mo a yal eight yish ta y I think here it's yish ta ha ve mu ha da raf. Actually, yeah, yeah, actually the chatapata counts in the syllable. Wait, let me get it. I think yish ta ha ve mu ha da raf. Yeah, so uh, you can count it next to the inshul if you're you can go through it if you want. You see. So that's how we know, even though we don't have the nakudos, that it has to be that way. Because, like I said, it's done by syllables in uh, units of eight syllables for each one. So there's your deed nefesh. Maybe, the, only, maybe the L was this. added. What? Maybe L was added. Maybe they didn't want to count yishtachaveh, the chatapatach, as a syllable. So the way yishtachaveh El mol hadarecha. The word no, L was added. You can't, you can't, but you look at all the other ones. This is repeated. Every single line, it becomes, for us, it becomes, uh, uh, they they make it the kamats instead of, so it has to be, I was wondering, then because all the editions of it have it cur- that, the same way. How do, and I was wondering, how do they know? And uh, then I said, I tried to do the um, Tate Nuan, it didn't work. And then I found, of course, Rav Mazuz, as always, he points out that the, it's all by syllables. And that's how it has to be. A, by the uh, way, Ramazuz points out something else in uh, his Parsha sheet um, this week. 
Uh, I didn't know this, uh, but many Svardim don't. We have another Shor Shudas tune, right? Askinu Sudasa. And a few different tunes for that. And many Svardim don't say it. Well, he rec- well, why not? I didn't, he records how uh, when he was young uh, in Tunis, the Chabad rabbi who started there, his name was right, Pinson. There's a lot of Chabad in Pinson. I guess they're all one family. He uh, told all the students they have to sing this song. It's important. And his father said, absolutely not. And why not? So he says, uh, I'll read you the words. You know, it says there, Hanik Kalvin de Chatsifin, and things like that. He says, well, you have nothing else to do just to fight with the Kalvin de Chatsifin, the Achim de Klipos, and ours. Do we, any of us, have any clue what's going on here about the Klipos? This is all very Kabbalistic. I guess you could be Muhammad Sos that no one knows what they're saying anyway. So what's the difference? It's just a good tune. But if it's you actually know what it's saying, you know that you don't know what it's saying unless you're some expert in Kabbalah or you're learned. You don't like it, Moshe, what he said? No, so it's it's all Kabbalah, number one. Yeah. Number two, let me tell you what I heard in the base Medrash of Gershom Sholem in the 1970s. Magabi Yedid Nefesh. Yeah. In 1972, in the 400th yard side of the uh, Ari, Yehuda Libis, who was then a graduate student, now a famous professor, was given the job of creating a critical edition based on the original manuscript, which, by the way, is in the library in JTS in New York. Uh, so they could sing it at this uh, great Asifa that all the scholars were going to have in Sva to celebrate the 400th yard side of the of the Ari. What they discovered when they tried to do a critical edition, meaning the correct, accurate text, you can't sing it. It doesn't sing, and that's why it. I was told by I think it was Tishbi that the reason that the text we use to sing is because if you try to sing the original text, it just doesn't flow. But you're assuming then, uh, I'm assuming that the text became what it is, however, the Bacher Zetzer or whoever made it up, and then Somebody we created along the song. The way. I, I'm when, not, when I don't try- think they made the song, they, they changed it, Duff going to make the song. That doesn't seem to make sense. That that was uh, the Messiah. In received. fact, the song we sing. How old is that song? That version. I don't. The one we commonly sing. I don't That's know. That's an interesting question. I mean, the the original was published in Sefer Haredim at the end of Sefer Haredim in Venice, sixteen hundred. Yeah, but it's not singing. And by the way, Eskilus is 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 one of the things that the Ari himself uh, wrote. R- one of the wrote, three. Right, correct. So, so it's all is Kabbalah. Saying, so yeah, so Rabbi Mazuz is saying we don't know Kabbalah. Why are we singing it? Uh, but uh, Rabbi Pinson. Well, uh, there are some said, people who think they do know Kabbalah. Okay, that's you why know, we all say us, uh, Apa Karsim, who uh, you know. Sorry, I don't... Okay. okay, very good. Thank you very much, as always, Moshe. Sure. Moshe, for those who don't know, is an expert in many of these areas. Uh, <laughs> Uh, in fact, for Torah in Motion, we should have you, uh, you've, pre- you've studied and uh, presented and uh, written so many interesting and important things. Oh, thank uh, you. We could all benefit. Okay, everyone, let's continue. I want to uh, sort of finish up. Uh, at t- I want to finish up today with uh, the last, I guess, chapter of separatism in um, Eretz Yisrael. Well, with Rav Cook. Uh, maybe we'll finish, maybe we won't. I still have a couple of things I didn't get to. And I, I want to begin just by reading you. I mentioned Ratzvi Yehuda Cook, his letter to the Aguda. And the fact that the Aguda, the, the, the story hasn't been written honestly. And if there's an honest Aguda historian, he has to write it and explain that these people in Eretz Yisrael were not what we today consider mainstream Aguda. They were Kitsonim. And uh, but you need to tell the story. Ratzvi Yehuda, here's his letter. It's published in Orha Mizrach, the first one explaining this is in response to a good Yisrael that invited him to the first uh, Sifa uh, in Eretz Yisrael. And look, he was friends with many of these Rabbanim. He was close with some of them as well. But he had to he had to say the truth. He said, "Kitzad yitakein lishtatef b'tamulaz zo shal oto guf tziburi." How can I participate? With such an organization, Asher Bishmo Hamafurosh, with its uh, in its name, Uvanasiat Diglo Nasatab Bifarhesia Oto Havoda Atmeya the Meshach Shani Mirabot. He's talking about how all those years it was under the mantle of Aguta, all the terrible things against Rav Kook that went on. 
קצר את ימי חייו של אדוני אבי מורי הרב זצ"ל. לכבות אורו של עולם ישראל ואורייתא, that is, the things they did, the way they attacked him and abused him, shorten of Cook's life. And it goes on to say, וכון כון נערים, that the young people were you know, brought up, educated, know our Agudas Yisrael, these were members of Agudas Yisrael. Now granted, they never would have been allowed to be Agudas Yisrael in Poland or Lithuania, but they were part of the official Agudas Yisrael. מיוז מאומנים במשחק, לרצוח נפש את אדוני אבי מרי הרב זל, וגם הוזמן כל אנשים לראות במחזה טומא זה. What he's referring to here is when on Purim they put on this whole episode here where they announced it, they publicized it, that they're having an event, they're putting Rav Kook on trial, and they put him on trial and then they executed him. My memory is that they didn't burn him, it was that they, actually, they had a fake shooting of him, and Mayor Porish was there. Later on he had to say that he had nothing to do with it, and he was shocked and outraged, but this was, I mean, this outraged everyone one in Europe, when the Rabbonim in Europe heard about this, they couldn't, they, they were, so then why did Rav Zonenfeld and the rest of them, how, you know, whether because they, uh, they were afraid of these people, you know, these crazies, or, you know, they were all, it was incestuous, they were married into each other's families, but the fact remains that the, 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 the most terrible, terrible things were done to be Mavazek Do Yisrael, the Mavaza, the, the Gera Rebbe, and the Lubavitcher Rebbe when he came, uh, So, and that is, that they, this was officially part of the Goodness Yisrael. What can I tell you? Uh, until Natura Karta broke away. Uh, okay, I want to now, uh, we, we basically did the American story of Austrit separatism. Um, I want to read you something, though, from Ramosha Feinstein. Because uh, this, uh, I mean... I think this, I, I don't know how to, you know, how to respond to this other than it's saying it sounds right. Rav Moshe is asked, uh, we saw Rav Moshe sign the letter against being in the joint rabbinic organization and the, and the communal organizations. It's in uh, Igras Moshe, Orachayim uh, 2, number 61. And the question is, are you permitted, Imrashai Leyos member? That's how Ramosha writes it. Uh, I guess today we would say Chavar or something. I love when Ramosha, the way he writes, even in a car, he doesn't know how to say car in Hebrew, so he writes car. Kuf, I think it's Kuf Alaf Reish. And, uh, so can you be a member of Mosad Shemachalim Shabbat, Shabbat, Can you be a member of an institution or organization that violates Shabbos? And uh, he says that... Um, In the city you are, there's a, a Mossad. Now, it could be a JCC or something like that that violates Shabbos. He says, Pashu Navarro, Shasar Liotchum, Ishri Shal Israel, Me Israel, Yos, member of Mossad Kazer, Afrin Yetzadaka. He says, You can't be a member of any organization, let's say Federation. Federation has events on Saturday, let's say, and they definitely do in places. when there aren't many Orthodox Jews, or they still have non-kosher events. Ramosha holds, you can't be a member of this. And by the way, the Rav might have agreed with him on this. And uh, I don't know if it makes me an extremist. It sort of makes sense. Uh, you know, I, you know I, I don't think your local JCC to be a member to use the gym. I don't, Ramosha might have been banning that also. I, I, I think that is a little different. I don't see how that's different than being a member of an, an, any gym. Uh, but if you're part of the organization, it's like uh, the Federation or you, you, JCC, you're on the board, you're involved with it, and it's a Mahal Shabbos, then Ramosha is saying you have a responsibility. Uh, I think the more liberal Orthodox would say, no, you don't. You're a member, but you're only a member for the good stuff, not for the bad stuff. But here's an example of where we see the philosophy of Elstrid. And again, this might even be taken too far, because mm -hmm. it could be that even mm -hmm. rabbis, Rav Soloveitchik and Rav Mordechai Harvitz, might have agreed in this situation. Um, because it's not like when you're in Frankfurt and you each have your own shul. But you're part of the community. Uh, here, you're part of one organization, the same organization. So I, I'm not sure about that. But that's, that's look, we don't have, as we said, real Auschwitz in America. But uh, you all know that uh, the more right wing wouldn't be involved in federation. Uh, it's a bit of a problem because, you know, there's an old expression. If you're not there for the takeoff, you can't be there for the landing. So you can't really complain about yeshivas not getting money from federation if you're not involved with federation. <laughs> Uh, but uh, so we have we don't have official communities, but we uh, we pretty much are divided between the more liberal modern Orthodox that agrees with being in organizations like Federation, even if they do violate Shabbos. Um, 
Ramosha, it seems to be saying that you can't be involved in an organization like that if they uh, violate Shabbos. Now, it could be that Federation today, many of them don't violate Shabbos. That is, they have uh, trips to Israel or Europe, and on Shabbos is a free day, and they make sure all the food's kosher. I can tell you absolutely, though, that in many places in America, that is not the case, and they still will have uh, non-kosher events because they don't have any Orthodox. What do they need to? And uh, that Ramosha would say you can't. I, I know many rabbis of the more liberal side would say you can still be a part, uh, but Ramosha disagrees. But I want to complicate matters now because um, in the Masaras Moshe, which is the um, the uh, record of uh, the years of Ramordechai Tendler, uh, being the secretary to Ramosha, all the questions he asked, full of uh, great stuff. Uh, um, you see something in there that complicates the story. Uh, this is volume four, pages 440 to 441. First of all, just not really relevant per exactly to what I'm going to say, but it's interesting because in page 440, he was asked, Rabbi Schwab had ruled, Rabbi Schwab, reflecting a real Auster mentality, I guess you could say, had ruled that you can't... Um, Toro College. He said that um, Toro College, it, it's forbidden. Toro College had rented from a conservative uh, synagogue uh, or a sort of school, it says, in Brooklyn, uh, rooms. So the question is, is it usher to go into there? Because Rabbi Schwab said it's forbidden for Orthodox Jews. Actually, he said forbidden for anyone, but no one else is paying attention. So forbidden for Orthodox Jews to go to this branch of Torah College because it's inside a uh, conservative uh, school. Um, I guess a Solomon Schechter. And Ramosha says, what's the problem? They're renting the space. It's at night. Uh, no, no, nothing's going on then. And uh, it's not even a synagogue. It's a school. So Ramosha doesn't uh, think it's a problem. And Rabbi Tenra says, is there, he says, is there an issue there? Maybe we should be machmir. The students shouldn't daven. You know, they would daven. Uh, I guess Davin Myriv, maybe between classes at night, uh, and Ramosha says it's not a problem. So here you see Rabbi Schwab, like a Frankfurt mentality, you can't even step foot into it. And then Ramosha was asked again, Rabbi Bloch, Blech, or Bloch from Lakewood asked him, can he go um, to Darshan to speak at uh, the conservative synagogue? Um and then because and Rav Moshe said uh, there's not an issue, even your Miyahu. Um what the Ramosha, he knew his Tanakh. Uh he brings a proof. Uh uh look at this. Ramosha brings a proof from Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah. This is uh, chapter 19, verse 14. It says Jeremiah came from Tophet, where the Lord had sent him to prophesy. Tophet is where they did all their they, they sacrificed the kids or whatever, the Avoda Zara, whatever they bad things they did there. Hashem sent Yirmiyahu to go mamish inside the, with these of all day of Odazara and Ramosha, and then Yirmiyahu spoke to them. So Ramosha doesn't think it's a problem to go um, to go to even to Makomos of Avodazara. And he says, uh, Ramosha says, every place where the Jews are, Yesh Inyan Malachis, Lodi Yamdarach, Yeshem Vitaraso. There's a reason wherever Jews are, you should go and preach the good word. That's actually Rav Schechter's opinion. In England, they say you can't go to the Limud conferences, or in America, people say, because the conservative are there and the reform. And Rav Schechter says, no, you have to go, because otherwise then they'll only hear the, uh, the other side. And uh, but that, So that's Rav Moshe, though. So it's quite interesting. Um, he says you have to consider, though, it could be in cases that it's going to give them a heksher, but they have to consider it. But Migar did not a problem. And to this Rabbi Bloch, he said, uh, no issue uh, uh, from Halacha. But then the next page. Remember when we saw Ramosha signs the open letter with all the other Rosh Yeshiva saying you can't be on a joint board of rabbis and you can't be on a uh, uh, you know synagogue council. So listen to this, Rabbi Kalman Winter. I never knew him. I'm sure some of you knew him. I Googled his name. Um, he was the son-in-law of Amos Bunim. So he was the rabbi in Buffalo. And uh, he asked the question to Rav Moshe, can I be a member of the Vad Rabbanim of Buffalo, which has reform and conservative rabbis? So obviously the answer is going to be no. Rav Moshe says you can't be on a joint board. That's the whole letter he signed. And Rav Moshe said, uh, 
New York. You can't compare the Vada Rabbanim of New York, which I assert, to the place in um, Buffalo. Why? Because in Buffalo, they're only asukim binyanet sibur. They're only involved in things, you know, for the community, uh, and therefore mutar amahem. Because you can even join with non-Jews for the betterment of the Jewish community. Uh, only if they join in dot for in religious matters is it us, sir. Uh, so he said to him, you could join it. Now, but wait a second. In New York, the Board of Rabbis also didn't do religious things. You have to conclude from this that Rav Moshe either was misinformed and thought that in New York, the Board of Rabbis did do religious things, or he thought that New York's a different case, maybe. It's a very it's a huge uh, community, and uh, the rabbis don't need to because there's enough Orthodox that the you know you don't need there's enough conservative and Orthodox each can do their own thing. Uh, but in a place like Buffalo, where it's very small and it's important to get together, whatever it is, here you have the Pharisee or Moshe giving permission. <laughs> you, no one would believe me if I said this, uh, but here it is in the Messorah's Moshe, Rav Moshe saying in a small town like Buffalo to be on a board of rabbis, Sheyesham Chaverim Shem Reformim, which has non Orthodox Jew rabbis. Rabbi Winter, you can be on it, and it's for the good of Kal Yisrael. You know, you go to the governor, let's say, you go together, or the mayor, you go, both rabbis go, and uh, you make a case. It's, it's a lot better, you know. Uh, <laughs> It's a contradiction. It absolutely is a contradiction. So we have to explain. Uh, we have to, you know, tarte de satre, but you have to explain the steer like we always do. There, there has to be an explanation. And you can come up with a, the couple like uh, I just mentioned. But here we see that Rev Moshe is definitely not like the other Roshi Yeshiva in that he was willing in individual cases like this. I, I'm sure they hate the fact that this was recorded. That Ramosha acknowledged that in cases like this, you could be a rabbi on the board like this, because he says you could be with non-Jews. You know, if there's a group for the betterment of Israel, let's say, and uh, the, all you know, all the non-Jews are coming together, and they ask the Jews to join. Of course, you can. So he says you can be with the non-Orthodox rabbi. Um, that that is very that's very interesting. Let's put it that way, and it complicates the story. Uh, I want to show what I found just this week. I've seen this already, but this is uh, an earlier one. I was at the um, the Center of Jewish History. I'm on sabbatical now. Baruch Hashem. I have a whole semester. It's the greatest thing. I have to wait every seven years, though. But uh, they pay full to full salary one semester, only, not full salary the whole year. But at least I got one semester. The problem is, look at this. I can't type and I can't write. So, uh, but it's coming off, uh, they say, in a couple weeks. And uh, so I have time to go to the archives, do the things I like to do. Uh, and uh, lo and behold, I went to uh, the Center for Jewish History and I found, uh, let me show you what I found. Uh, hold on. Uh, mm, oh, here. I found something from 46, Synagogue Council of America. Look who it's signed by. Who's the president? Herbert S. Goldstein is one of the leading Orthodox rabbis. And uh, although the stationery needed to be updated, because here it lists Isaac Landsman as president. So who's on this? Who's Orthodox? Simon Kramer. He later becomes head of uh, Sk uh, Skokie or Chicago. Um, and uh, this William Weiss. I didn't know who William Weiss was. So I Googled it. William Weiss was the head of the OU. Because, oh, because look, take a look at this. Um, uh, where is it? Uh, the Synagogue Council of America includes the Rabbinical Council of America and the Union of Orthodox, um, Orthodox Jewish Foundations. So th th this is what we're talking about. Uh, this is what the whole dispute was about. When I Googled uh, Weiss's name, lo and behold, it came up from 34. Weiss rebukes Rabbi Convitz over Kashras. Rabbi Convitz was the Rav in Newark, the son-in-law of the Ridbaz. Sharp criticism of the statement issued by Rabbi Joseph Convitz last Sunday challenging the authority of the Union of Orthodox Jewish Congregations in questions of kosher's regulation was voiced by William Weiss, president of the Union. What happened is that uh, the uh, the old-time Rabboni from the Gudas Rabboni, they were very critical of the OU. And they said, you can't trust the OU Hashkacha. And they said, it's Masig Vol. Remember, these old-time rabbis made their living on kosher's, many of them. In fact, Ramosh has a tshuva about this, that you can't take away Ashkacha from the old rabbis uh, for the new organizations. He means the OU. 
But the OU, you know, there was a lot of Hifkerus and there's a lot of conflicts going on. So the OU wanted to have one, um, you know, standard with, and what, what does he says? He says that, uh, Weiss says that this is a, an attempt on the part of rabbinical groups to assume for its individual rabbis the sole authority to issue kosher sanctions. During the past few years, the union has been endeavoring to establish order in the chaotic field of kosherists. The kosherist policy of the union is a non-commercial one. It is opposed to charging fees for achsherim. Um, the union feels that the Jewish public should not be given any grounds for a complaint that prices of food products are excessively increased because of kosher. This is 1934. And look at this. The OU doesn't charge. It's all free. It's a service. Obviously, things have changed. OU charges, a, well, I don't know if they charge a lot. They make a lot. We, since the OU is chartered as a church, uh, well, a religious institution, we don't know what they actually make. It's a big secret. You can't go on GuideStar. Like, you can go on you know, all other nonprofits and see how much money is made. So it's uh, it's like a chartered as a synagogue. Uh, so, uh, but they they make a lot of money. They support all these good institutions, uh, like uh, the SJ, uh, whatever they call it, the the rabbis on campus. I forget what they call them, and all sorts of other things. But now look what it says: the Union of Orthodox Organizations lists among its members rabbis Leo Young, Herbert Goldstein, Bernard Drachman, Moses Hyamson. H. Pereira Mendes, David Asola Pool, Joseph Luckstein, and then some politicians, State Senator Albert Wald, Harry Fischel, uh, State Supreme Court Justice, um, was Hofstadter, etc. Now, those are all fine, nice rabbis, but you know, you're living in 1934, and you're a yeshivish type of a religious or a guy from Eastern Europe. On the one hand, you have the Gedola Yisrael. All the great old-fashioned European rabbis who know Shas and Posty backwards and forwards, and then you have these other modern type of rabbis, great orators, influential. It's sort of uh, you know you can see how you would favor the other rabbis, but historically the OU was doing the proper thing, the better thing, because uh, I guess you needed the, their minds, their modern type of forward-thinking, sophisticated minds to conclude that, uh, you know, we need to have a, a better system than the local rabbis. But I look, if I was living then, and I'm like I am now, if it's uh, Rabbi Konvitz and all these other big rabbinim versus these modern rabbis on the Upper East Side, I think I'm going to go with the old-fashioned rabbis uh, who are the Gaonim and Shas and Poskim and... Um, but that was, I wrote about it on the Svarian blog a couple of years ago, the Machokis, where um, where Agudas Rabboni declares that the OK, you can't eat from the OK, the guy's an ignoramus. I mean, the guy who ran the OK was a chemist, and he was telling the Rabboni what's kosherous and what's not. Uh, you know, in some areas, he probably was right, because he knew about the chemistry. But uh, they saw it as complete chutzpah, and they put the OK, and him in Cheyron, by the way, uh, uh, the OK only became acceptable when it was sold to Rabbi uh, Levy. OK, I want to now move on to the last uh, segment of the, uh, I guess, the controversy or the discussions about separatism. And we we spoke about Eretz Yisrael, and I just want to turn to Ruf Cook and his school, because you do find something interesting. And for Ruf Tzvi Huda Cook, Rabbi Bomberger, and we're going to return after this. We finish this. We're back to Rabbi Bomberger. I think I have two classes, all sorts of good stuff about Rabbi Bomberger before we close it out. Um, uh, and by the way, I have I know people think it's they're looking online. They're seeing like 10 talks on Rabbi Bomberger. <laughs> but uh, but uh, we do have, I have members of the family, grandchildren from Europe. I'm sure in America also, but in England and elsewhere, listening to the classes. So uh, that's nice. But uh, Rabbi Bomberger be, assumes a role as an icon for Tzvi Yehuda Cook, and if you believe him, for Rav Avraham Yitzhak Cohen. So let's talk about that for a little and turn to the school, in quotes, of Rav Cook. And what I'm going to share with you now actually was published in the Daniel Sperber Jubilee volume. I published an article on Hirsch's, the, the reception of Shamsha Rafael Hirsch among the Haredim and among the religious Zionists, and you can see the article on my academia page. So why do I mention this? Because I think a lot of people probably look at the article and they start looking the first few pages, skimming through it, and they're like, hey, I know all this. Because the first part of the article is reprinted pretty much, most of it, in Changing the Immutable. When I dealt with uh, the Haredi Man Hirsch and all about the kippa and all that. But if you just keep going to the second part of the article, it's not reprinted. It's all new stuff. It's about Rav Cook and his school and uh, Hirsch. So it's worth uh, skimming a few more pages. And... Uh, 
look, we know that for the Haredim, they want to make Hirsh Agado for their communities, and therefore the issue they have to deal with is Purim Derech how can, how can he be a Gado if he advocates Purim Derech So they have their ways of dealing with that. The, the followers of Rav Kook, however, they um, they have a different problem. Not Tarim Derech their problem is ouster, separatism. And therefore they feel the Haredim build Hirsh up, and they do that by creating like a a forbessert version, an improved, a better version of Rav Hirsch uh, in their model because they want to include him in the canon. And I think the reason they want to is because a good Sisro really comes out of German Orthodoxy and uh, it's important. Uh, look, they have so many Gadoli, they don't need Hirsch. So they have lots of Gadoli, but they want him. Um, the school of Rav Cook, they want to remove Hirsch from the pedestal because of Austrit, which goes against their ideology. They're not really bothered by Hirsch's anti-Zionism. We know about his anti-Zionism. Uh, he um, he writes that uh, what um, um, he, what Ritzi Hirsch Kalisher thought of as a um, great mitzvah settling the land, he thought of it as um, not a small Avera. Um, this isn't a major point in the opposition of the Hirsch, of the cooking school to Rabbi Hirsch, because look, there's lots of Gadolim who are anti-Zionists, so you don't need to focus on Hirsch. But Austrit is in a different category. Remember, the principle of Austrit, which is one of the guiding lights of Rav Shamsha Rafael Hirsch, becomes the ideology of the Germ German Aguda. It's the ideology of the Jerusalem separatist community, the uh, um, which refused to be part of the larger uh, community. For Rav Kook, on the other hand, a major part of his philosophy was the unity of the Jewish people especially in the land of Israel. Even the sinners are playing an important role. And therefore, Rav Kook is strongly opposed to any sorts of religious separatism. He actually refers to it as a thought of idolatry and describe those who um, support separatism as, quote, doing the work of a Amalek. Um, in Ratzvi Yehuda, actually censored this when it appeared. He censored it so that it's not, it's not do, he says the ideology of separatism is the deed of Amalek. But Rav Kook himself actually says that those who advocate separatism are doing the deed of Amalek. Remember, Amalek it, it attacked the weak. It tried to separate the Jews. And uh, that's what Rav Kook says. Uh, um, now, the importance of this in Rav Kook's eyes is seen that on his deathbed, he repeated his call to reject religious separatism and calls it, quote, the uh, um, uh, the, the foundation of heresy. Uh, he says also in Mamre Rea, it's Derech Aminos Mamash, Derech Aminos Mamash, Vachol Yesod Arayon, Shahotzas, Poshe Yisrael, Mikol Alma, Halohu Rayon Pasul. That is, the ideas of heresy and of separating. Uh, uh, Jew, the sinners from the from the nation. This it, it's um it's a false ideology. Uh, it's derech minus. Um, um, now with uh, yeah, what he's saying is that the derech of minus of uh, heresy comes out, as I'll explain arises from uh, separatism, uh, this false ideology. So with such a strong uh, anti austrit stand, it's understandable that the followers of Cook would look to downgrade here's the significance. And this really is seen prominently with the son, Ritzi Yehuda Cook, who we've had classes on Ritzi Yehuda. And as with the Haridim, um, Ritzi Yehuda focuses on the issue of Austrit. Um, we, we spoke about how the Aguda never really had any issue, desire to separate um, uh, officially. Um, However, the ideal of removing yourself as much as possible from the uh, irreligious uh, was always present. And Hirsch's uh, you know, words were, were cited. Uh, after all, Hirsch spoke about the danger of being in proximity to heresy. That's an idea that continues even if officially you're part of the state of Israel or the Vat Halumi. Before the state of Israel, something called the Vat Halumi. And uh, 
Agudistan, who came from Poland and Lithuania, never separated. They joined the Vat Halomi. And the Chazunish actually writes, in opposition to the separatists, he writes that uh, this is no different than what we have in Lithuania and Poland. You know, uh, that they're in, as long as you have a rabbi who is, is good for the community and uh, is not forced by the irreligious to do things, then fine, we can uh, we can have our communities. Rav Chaim Ozer-Grzynski, he was very close with um, Rav Kook or C.P.S. Frank. He had no relationship with, really, with these Hungarians who ran the Eta Haridit and others. But uh, when C.P.S. Frank writes to Rav Chaim Ozer, asking him to declare the Shlita of the Eta Haridit puzzle, because it's Masig Vul, Rav Chaim Ozer writes back to him that, you know, I'm not going to do that. And it's good. It's always, he basically says it's good to have people on the right. They keep us honest and they keep you, uh, it's a, it's nothing wrong if they want to have it. If their philosophy is that they have to, they want to be separatists, we can't forbid them. They have the right to do that. Uh, Rav Chaim Moser is saying that. Now he is not part of that community and it's nothing to do with them. But uh, but I have to say, although Rav, Rav Chaim Moser and the Lithuanian Adolim all associated with Rav Kook and Ritzi Pesach Frank and they regarded them as the Rabbani, not the separatists, even though technically they were connected to with, through the Aguda with the separatists, on a few occasions, they did sign public declarations that said that um, a Jews in Eretz Israel should join the separatist community. Now, no one listened to it, and none of the Agudistan who moved there listened to it. Uh, the German Orthodox, they started to join the separatist community, but they're like, these are sophisticated, secularly educated German Orthodox. How can they be in a community which says that has a cherem on the Hebrew language? So um, it, it never worked. Uh, but here you have this issue, and you can see in the biography of Rosonenfeld, Maradar Yisrael, how do you explain how uh, in Lithuania and Poland, there's no separatism and no desire for it. And in uh, and yet you do have people, even rabbis, I think even Rechaim Moser signing these things. You know, they're asked by the Aguda in Jerusalem to sign this, and they do sign it, that the Jews in Israel should join the separatist community. Uh, uh, either you could say they're just doing it to uh, go along with uh, what they're asked to do, I, but I think it's more than that. I think, uh, remember, in Eretz Yisrael, you already have a separatist community. So as long as you already had a separatist community, then if you have a choice, uh, be part of the separatist community. When there's a state of Israel, you can't be in a separatist community. Of course not. You got to be part of the, the state because the money, the taxes and all that. But, as, but when before there's a state, uh, now in Lithuania and Poland, they didn't have separatist communities. So you're going to say, well, you're going to you should try to fight for it like Hirsch did and change the law. You know, in theory, they could have they could have fought in Poland and Lithuania. Maybe they could have passed the law. They never thought it was important. They never thought it was a big deal. Some people were opposed ideologically. We saw the Nitziv. He was ideologically opposed to this. Others were as well. I don't think Rav Chaim Moser was opposed ideologically. If all of a sudden the government of Poland, because the film was part of Poland between the war, if the government of Poland decided, you know, the Orthodox can have their own communities, I'm sure Rav Chaim I would have said, okay, from now on, we need to be part of our own communities, not one overarching community. But it isn't something worth fighting over, making an issue for. It's They didn't make it. I, I think that's best how to explain it. Uh, uh, so Rav Tzvi Yehuda creates this whole, I have to say, with all due respect to him, a whole fiction of, of, of the history of German Orthodoxy. And I told this story once uh, actually at the Sephardic Institute, and I was there for Shabbos once, and lo and behold, in the audience was one of the big students of Ritz And I, I'm, I'm talking about how Ritz creates his whole myth, and it's all not true, but it serves his purpose. And I, I thought, you know, with these uh, Hasidim, a big rabbis, they get very offended because their attitude is like, the rabbi can never be wrong, and this and that. And the rabbi was Rabbi Avi Gisser. I don't know if anyone knows the name from Ofra. He was right for many years of Ofra. You can look him up. I then later learned, and uh, I, when speaking to him, I saw that he's not like these uh, Hardal, just close-minded types. Uh, he's actually one of the founders of Tsar, even though he was the modern like Orthodox rabbinic organization. So even though he was a close student of Tsiuda, afterwards I went up to him and I said that you know uh, what Tsiuda said really isn't true, and he said yes, we know it's not true, but you know in other words, he understood. Uh, he he didn't take it uh, personally like that, uh, um, but. Um, what, so what what is this? Well, Ritzvi Yehuda creates this fiction, this myth of uh, these two people, one great rabbi, Bomberger, and the other 
basically the equivalent of a, a good speaker who's a pulpit rabbi who can have a good influence in his writing, but uh, is in a completely separate league, and not just the league that Bomberger said, different league, but uh, doesn't see him as a different personality at all. And well, so for instance, he begins um, by talking about how um, what Hirsch did was terrible because he split the community. And um, not only did he split it, he didn't really have support. He, Smirci uh, Huda, in his version of it, says there was eleven people who joined with Hirsch to cre create this uh, separatist community, and uh, many observant Jews did not. Well, this isn't true. Eleven people started the community, the Gesellschaft, as it was called. But when it invited in 1851 Hirsch to be rabbi, there was uh, some hundred, they say members, I think that means fa families. Uh, and by the time the government permits Elstrit, another 20 years later, there's many, many more. So this idea that it's a bunch of malcontents who just decide to bring Hirsch in and Hirsch uh, agrees to go there and uh, it creates havoc in, in the Kehla Kadosh, so that's not true at all. Uh, Ratsi Yehuda also says, that when it became possible for the Orthodox to officially separate from the general community, the Gedolim in Germany refused to. And he says, Rav Yaakov Etlinger, and who are the Gedolim, he says, Rav Yaakov Etlinger, the Würzburger Rav, and Rav Moshe Mainz of Frankfurt. And, uh, and Rav Yehuda leaves no doubt that for whatever good qualities Hirsch has, he's not one of the Gedolim. That is, he's Rav Hirsch, Zichron Livracha. He's not Hagaon, Hagado, anything like that. And he can't measure up to Ettlinger, Bomberger, or even Moshe Mainz. Well, again, with all due respect to Ritzvi Yehuda, now what I'm saying now, I, I'm just repeating there's a, a scholar, rabbi in Israel from the German community, David, Hunch, David Henschke. And uh, he's really an expert in the Rambam, and in, 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 in a lot of areas, actually. Yeah. Uh, in, in in Talmudic literature, I even uh, I wrote a book on the Haggadah Shal Pesach, I believe the development. But he so this isn't even his area, but these are like devouring you doing known things. Anyone who's like educated or from a German Orthodox family could have responded. He writes in the letter the journal Hamayan how it's really painful for him to respond openly and ref, you know. Um, Ritzi Yehuda was a great tzaddik. I'm not saying he was a gadol in Shas and Poske, but he was a tzaddik. He had tzaddik yisod olam. No question about it. The son, as we say, benan shal kadoshim. These are the words that Henshka uses. It's not a pleasant task to publicly, um, you know, show that someone is wrong and made a mistake. Uh, I had a situation myself once, not that I, I, I had a chance to publicly uh, point out a mistake, and it was a bad one, but I decided not to on the blog post. I discussed it with someone because this person is like, is, is it going to be strong? Everyone would know his name. And uh, whatever, you know, I don't need to point out everyone's errors. You know, it's enough that they point out my errors. I don't need to point out everyone's errors. Uh, cover the Torah. Uh, um, I point out the errors sometimes, and it's nothing wrong with pointing out errors. Everyone has errors, but this was like, this was like a bad one. That uh, whatever. It, uh, um, but what Rasiyuda says is completely wrong. Um, this idea that Hirsch advocated Austrit in opposition to the Chachmei Torah. First of all, Ravakov Etlinger dies be they're, they're, before they're allowed to separate. And uh, there's no evidence that he opposed separatism. On the contrary, Rebecca Vettlinger speaks about how we should be as distant as we can from the reformers. It's true that he doesn't want to put them in Cherem. He has a letter to Rav Shoma Eger saying we're not going to put him in Cherem. But that doesn't mean you're together with them uh, because putting him in Cherem means they're not part of the Jewish people anymore. But, uh, you know, look how, uh, I want to read you how, after describing the Gedolim, Bomberger and Etlinger, this is how he describes Hirsch. Hoged deyot v'sofer, shachiber sferim chashuvim, avalolo habasis shalom danut toronit gedula. That is, he's a thinker and a writer. He wrote some good books, important books, but he does it on the basis of great Torah learning. Uh, so there's a, uh, because they opposed to Austrit, Hirsch, who's the big advocate of it, his significance has to be lessened. Now, as for Bomberger, we've already seen. Bomberger, contrary to Ritzvi, who the Bomberger never speaks against Austrit. He never said it's forbidden. He never says it's splitting the Jewish people, anything like that. What he says is there's no obligation. And we know at other times Bomberger did advocate separatism. But if the community gives you everything you need, 
They're no longer as an obligation. And if you remain in the community, there's even positive things you can do. You can bring them close to religion. But if you choose to leave the community, that's 100% permissible also. And there's positive things you can do as well. In other words, he left it as an option. And he never said that one way is better. And he certainly, contrary to his view, never said that it's forbidden and separatism is wrong. And uh, it's a, it's advised Jewish people. He never said this. Uh, he was not on principle an opponent of separatism. It had uh, Ritzio decided the, the Mate Levy or Mordechai Harvitz, they were in Frankfurt, he would be absolutely correct, but not Reb Bomberger. Uh, listen, uh, Ritzio says, uh, he, of course, he loves this part where uh, uh, when Hirsch says to Bomberger, how do you contradict me? I'm uh, I'm the of the community. So Ritzio says, um, he actually gets this wrong also. Remember, it, it was Bomberger himself says, but we're not Haverim, you know, I'm greater. But the way Ratsuyuda tells the story is the followers of Bomberger came to Hirsch and said, with all due respect to Rabbi, you, Rabbi Hirsch, you're not the equal of the Gaon of Würzburg and Talmud and Poskin. You have to listen to the Psak of one of the Gedoli Ador, not the reverse. Okay, but as we saw, it was actually Bomberger who said, I don't have to listen to you. Hirsch, because uh, I can give my own psaac, because although the halacha is, when one rav decides that another rav can't contradict it, that only means, that's only if they're at equal level, not if one is greater. And by the way, uh, Rav Bamberger never said to Hirsch, you have to listen to my psaac. I mean, Ratsiuda tells it like they said to Rav Hirsch, since the Godo Hador, Rav Bamberger gives his psaac, you Hirsch have to be mevatel your opinion, and you have to now follow Bamberger. No one said that, and Bamberger never said that. All Bamberger said is that the members of the Frankfurt community can listen to me, because I've given him a psaac. He never said that, ba that Hirsch, you yourself are obligated to listen to me, and he never even said that the members of the Frankfurt community are obligated to listen to him. He said that if they want to listen to him, they can. But if they want to be a separatist and not pay double taxation, they can do that as well. So wait till you hear next, maybe another 10 minutes this, uh, wait, five minutes, wait till you hear where we'll see who to, where did the ideology, this puzzle, phony, false to Torah ideology of Austrit comes from? That, that again, with all due respect to Svi Yehuda, that's the ultimate creation of a myth. This uh, he's basically Bekitzer, and I'll get to him more detail next class. Only from the impure German environment, only someone who's assimilated into that Germanic non-Jewish environment could such an ideology ever have arisen of Austrit. Which again, so what are you going to tell me about the rabbis of Hungary? who were not at all assimilated, and they were as backwards, you know, from general culture as can be imagined, and they also came up with the principle of Austrit. So, I mean, it's really interesting, Ritsiuda, but it's like, it's the creation of this myth that, uh, uh, well, I, I have a few more words to say about Ritsiuda. And by the way, his followers don't give up. There's a Rabbi Yosef Elner, who wrote a whole piece in opposition to Henschka, and it's just wrong, wrong, wrong. And uh, it's like Das Torah. The, the, from them, it's like the same thing as the Haredim. It's see who does the Das Torah. So even if the facts don't agree, you have to come up with, so when you, you don't have the answers, they, the Kellner says, well, we know that Ritzvi Yehuda must have had this knowledge because he didn't speak without the knowledge, you know? And and then he says something like, well, Gadol Yisrael are given the guidance and therefore, I mean, it's, how, how can you argue when people come back to you, you give them facts and they say, well, uh, you know, God watches over the righteous and all that sort of stuff. Uh, it's just, it's embarrassing, I think. And, uh, but, that, that's the last thing I want to do. And then we're going to return. For those of you who haven't been interested, the last four weeks, all this great, I think five weeks about the separatism. I think it's great. And that's why we went on this uh, long tangent. We're going to come back to uh, to Rabbi Bomberger, his history, uh, um, the things he did in the community, some of his halacha chuvot. And uh, do you know he wore a gown? Wait to hear about this. He looked just like Hirsch with that gown. Some of you are probably thinking of him like an East European old-fashioned rabbi because he's a he's a traditional London gown. He wore the same sort of gown they all did. Wait till you hear about Rav Shmuel Salant. Rav Shmuel Salant comes all the way from Eric Yisrael and he comes uh, and sees uh, one of the Gadol Yisrael looking like some uh, Protestant uh, minister. And uh, wait, we'll get to that next class. But okay, let me uh, let me get to the comments and questions here. Uh, Someone privately says that daughter's middle name is Elka. 
Yes, we have. Uh, <laughs> uh, we the difference is though that with the women, like I said, is that many of the women would only have a shame chol. They wouldn't have a shame kodesh also because they weren't. I guess because they weren't called to the Torah. Um, I can't click now, so I don't know what the uh, Yochanan, what your uh, low and what your file is. Um, Susanna says the original is singable. Okay, we have to try it with the same tune you're saying. We have to. Um, I can't, okay, well, you know what? I've learned that uh, most things are singable. You can just lengthen it out a little, or you uh, it doesn't have to miss, doesn't have to. Everything doesn't have to agree. But uh, the problem is that now you have a shul, some shuls, not many, but you have a few shuls that have the core and sitter. And if you sing it, it's a problem because it doesn't really uh, doesn't really go together. Uh, I said Mayor Porsche. No, it's Menachem Porsche. Thank you, Rabbi Yellen. Yes. Mayor Porsche is someone else. That's his cousin. Mayor Porsche was in Rav Cook's camp. And he wrote a whole history of uh, the Yishuv Hayashon, the old Jerusalem. Menachem Porsche was in this Seire Agudis Yisrael. This, later, he became very mainstream. And he became very respectful of Rav Cook. And he acknowledged that in his youth, he was... Uh, I wouldn't say a miscreant, but he was among, uh, he was misled. But Rav Tzvi Yehuda held this against him the rest of his life and uh, regarded him as in Cherem, because Rav Yisrael Meltzer put them all in Cherem, all these kids. Now, I don't know, if you have an 18-year-old, you put him in Cherem, does that mean the Cherem lasts for the next 60 years? I, I think we have to give some leeway for the youngsters, uh, but it wasn't just the youngsters. You had crazy people who were not just youngsters in Jerusalem, real fanatics. People tried to injure Rav Cook physically. People tried to pour, gar pour garbage on him. Uh, there was even, a, at least the accusation was made, that they wanted to uh, push him off a, a building. Uh, terrible stuff. Um, Yes, Ramosha often used machine for car, but in his, um, that's in speaking, I guess, but in the, the Chuvos, it's car. Um, he also, in the Chuvos, he also has machine. He has machine, machine also, okay. I used to say it, machine, okay. yeah. Machine. Um, Zoom user, whoever that is, says the Rav refused to sign to Ramosha's Pesach about synagogue council. Yes, we, and uh -huh. Ramosha said that the Rav refused to sign, drove a stake into the Pesach. Yeah, well, we discussed this last week, uh, Look, had, had the Rav signed it, it would have been, uh, they would have had the whole uh, list of all the, the big adult in there, but the Rav didn't. And uh, it wasn't just the Rav students. You had students from the other yeshivas who were also members of these things. And uh, had the Rav signed it, then um, it would have been a problem for the graduates of uh, REITs. Uh, um, but the, the Rav did not think this was a halachic issue. He did not think halachically you could forbid. Look, the Rav refused to sign when the Y.U. Rosh Yeshiva came out in the 80s. When Rabbi Sinclair Krauss, they had the women's prayer group um, in his synagogue, and the Y.U. Rosh Yeshiva came out with this statement, just like the statement against the synagogue council, just the declaration that's forbidden. Later, if Schechter wrote a whole article explaining why, but the original statement was just uh, a statement signed by Rav Schechter, Rabbi uh, uh, Rabbi Parnas, a uh, few others, uh, I forget who, I think it was five of them, the Rav refused to sign it, even though he opposed these women's prayer groups, but he said, I, how can I say it's usser? That's at least how it's recorded. The Rav said, I can't sign and say it's usser. Uh, it's forbidden, because uh, it's not forbidden, he said. He just uh, thinks it's, 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 it's wrong, and uh, not everything that's wrong is forbidden. For a brisker, you have to be very careful. To say usser, it really has to be usser. Remember I told you that Reb Chaim had a big machokas with the other Rabbanim, because the other Rabbanim made a declaration that if someone doesn't uh, circumcise their son, he can't be buried in the Jewish cemetery. I think that was the Machokas. And uh, Reb Chaim says, what is one thing after the other? He doesn't circumcise his son. That's an Avera. But doesn't mean, since when is he, he can't be buried in a Jewish cemetery? So that's one sin. And then there's something. Uh, so uh, the Rav was a stickler for that. Um, Rabbi Lamb had this argument. Yes, Rabbi Lamb always said to speak. And uh, look, it's not just Rabbi Lamb. Rav Herschel Schechter. And uh, uh we have a rabbi listening from Toronto who's had this experience in person about this. But I mean, this is again and again, it, Rabbi Soloveitchik, but I don't know if Rabbi Soloveitchik, I mean, today would say, I don't even know if in his day, if he said it's absolutely forbidden to go to, you know, again, there's a distinction. If you go to the conservative synagogue and you both are speaking on a panel, did, did that maybe the Rav would be opposed. Rabbi Soloveitchik ever say there's a problem going in a non-Orthodox synagogue and speaking about, uh, 
uh, let's say, an Orthodox perspective. For heaven's sakes, the Rav went to St. John's uh, Catholic Seminary in Brighton, Massachusetts. That's where he presented the lonely man of faith. If you can go speak in a Catholic seminary, I mean, going into the sanctuary, sometimes the rabbis have an issue with that. But just uh, to go speak, I don't know if the Rav ever said that. His issue was giving legitimacy. If a conservative synagogue decides to invite an Orthodox rabbi to present the Torah perspective, I never heard that Rav Soloveitchik said that that's uh, a problem. And when you go to Limud, when you go to Limud, it's... Um, each one speaks themselves. And you're correct, the person who's writing, that this came when the rabbi from Lakewood, who's a big Tamil Chacham, um, uh, he wrote a safer, Shufri Deshtare, I think it is, uh, Reisman, Reisman, was, is it Reisman? I forget his Reisman. I forget the name of the, what? I think What's Reisman, though. No? Reisman, yes. Um, he yes, he did us. exactly what the Rav was opposed to and what the, all the Gedolim were opposed to. He, They wrote a book together, and they appeared together. And the problem is that uh, you listen to them both. Uh, what happens if the other guys, the re Reform Rabbi's arguments are better than Rabbi Reinman? And in one case, at least, absolutely it is, because Rabbi Reinman didn't know about Ibn Ezra. This position about uh, post mosaic authorship. So if you read that, you come out and you say, wait a second, if the reform rabbi knows this and he knows more than Rabbi Reinman, then maybe in other things he does as well. So they shut that down very quickly. And that's um, Common Winter, yes, who was the leading Orthodox rabbi in Silver Spring. Exactly. There can't be more than one Common Winter. That's uh, Amos Bunim, uh, Irving Bunim, the uh, great Orthodox lay leader whose biography was written by Amos Bunim. And uh, many, many descendants almost spewed him. And, uh, all, they're all over. It's a, it's a very important family and nephews and nieces. But um, and that common winter, I didn't know common winter was son of I saw this in the Masoris motion. Um, yes, JLIC. Why didn't young Israel join the synagogue council? Uh, good question. I guess they thought, uh, I don't know. It's because uh, in the 30s, they were not a right wing organization or the 40s. You know, they didn't like rabbis to begin with in the early years. But by the 50s, uh, it wasn't a right wing organization. I don't know why they didn't join it. Remember, they, though they were more, the young Israel always insisted on machitza. They were more in that way. They were more uh, sticklers for um, the definition of orthodoxy. The OU was full of orthodox, so-called, not so-called, orthodox shuls uh, without machitzas. The uh, young Israel didn't. Uh, M.J. Franco says, Jacob Rosenheim, in particular, a major founding father of the Aguda, was a corrigant of Hirsch in his latter days and revered his uh, Rebbe. You know, Ratzia Yehuda deals with Rosenheim also. Ratzia Yehuda, here's another example of the myth. He says that how can you compare Mizrahi to Aguda? Aguda was founded by Yaakov Rosenheim, who was a very dignified Bala boss, but you're going to compare that to Mizrahi, founded by Rav Reines, who was a gadol and learning... Uh, Okay, if you look at it that way, of course, uh, Mizrahi is uh, much more significant. But Agudas Yisrael wasn't just founded by Rosenheim. Yes, maybe they came up with the idea, and they were the ones who knew how to organize conventions. But, uh, you know, uh, Rav Tzvi Yehuda, I hate to say it, but uh, lots of Gadolim were involved in the founding of Aguda. They they were not the originators, but they joined on. You saw the Chavitz Chaim and uh, Rav Chaim Ozrozinski and all the rest of them. So, uh, um I mean, Rav Yehuda knew this. I mean, he was friends with these Rabbanim also, but he said the uh, the ideology came. But it's not, what can I say? It's not true. And uh, Nissen says, the meaning of Chardal has changed. Ezra, the Sophie Mute, proudly identified as Anora Haredet Tilemi. I did not know that, uh, that they identified that way. Ezra is already was in Germany. That was the German uh, youth organization, Ezra. I didn't know. But you know what? When you say Hanora yeah, Haredet, I, own youth, I, I saw... Yes, I saw it myself. Their headquarters, um, I was only a child in the 1980s, on, in the old Cholrev Shul in Rehavia. Um, and he had that title? It said sure. on the building. Yes, that's where I saw it. That's where okay. I saw it. I saw it because, myself on the building. Because, you know, in the earlier years, by the 80s already, we have a concept of Haredi. But earlier, Haredi just meant Ati. There was no difference. Uh, in fact, one of the big Mizrahi newspapers, the heading of it, it calls itself like a Yadut Haredit or something like that. Uh, uh, Yochanan. Yes, your hand is raised. The Thank you, Ruth. The OU, the OU with Ichud HaKilot HaHaredi Yot by America. I still have that stationery from the 1990s. That's ah, what it said nice. inside Thank the you. circle. They changed okay. orthodoxy. Okay, thank you. Uh, Yochanan, your hand is raised. 
Hey, Professor, I have so many comments I can't, but I won't keep you for three hours. The best, yeah. Uh, I, 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 uh, I, sent, I sent you a link in the chat here, uh, 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 essay not published yet, uh, Redefining Orthodoxy about Mendelssohn's Beer and Weisel. And I have a letter about it from Professor Lyman and from Biomin Rav Hamburger. So I wonder what you think about it. Very, well, very send it to me. It's hard for me to get it now. Uh, send it to my uh, email and I'll look at it. Uh, you know, the question is Mendelssohn. Here sh thought Mendelssohn was part of orthodoxy and certainly Vesley. And many people uh, thought Vesley were part of orthodoxy. His, his books are quoted by many, included by Ritzi Yehuda. Um, that's yeah, a but different, I, uh, but I'll look uh, at it and I can comment uh, if it's relevant to the class. If not, I'll comment privately to you. Yeah, um, I... I I bet you you will be so very surprised with the information there. Um, but it's not just about old rabbis; it's also about Haredi rabbis today in regards to Wesley and stuff like this. Um, but where where can I find your uh, email address? Oh, just uh, just to go to uh, just Google my name uh, or, or email Tara in motion. I'll give it to you, or I'll write it in here on my comments um, uh, so everyone can get my email. Um, I. I if you look in um, the books of Vesley that were published by the late Rav Tsuriel, he published one anonymously under a pseudonym, but then he published it with his name. He has a big okay. introduction with lots of Rabbonim, including from the Musa school, that Rav Simcha Zissel of Kelm and many others, they liked Vesley very much. Uh, Mendelssohn, we have the article by Mayor Hildesheimer, who lists numerous people. Oh, wow. Even though the Chassim Sofer opposed it, the Maram Shik read the Biur, and the Maram Shik was his biggest Talmud. Um, let me quickly, just uh, one, two more minutes. Um, Uh, someone says that uh, it's going to take a while before the real issues of Aguda, the history, and in, in Israel when Yitzhak Breuer comes there, and you know he 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 had a whole notion of uh, Taurus Eretz Yisrael and all that. that's going to take a little while to uh, come to be. And uh, Yaakov Rosenheim, he says, was opposed to Austrid and Eretz Yisrael. There's something else of interest: the Aguda. Once the state gets going or even 47, the Aguda in Israel under the Ger Rebbe is much more moderate than the Aguda in Chutzlaretz, including the Aguda of the Rosenheim. Rosenheim was opposed to the Auster the Eda Haredit, but he was a bit of an extremist, uh, and also Harry Goodman in London. So uh, we know that the Agudistin in Israel were very upset with what the Agudistin outside of Israel were doing, because they, they weren't there, they weren't on the scene, and they were trying to be like anti-Zionist types, uh, in uh, Chutzah Aretz. So, okay, there's a lot to discuss. As I said, next class, we will finish up with this Austrit and we'll return back to the great Gon, Rav Zeldman Bear Bamberger. Uh, thank you all for uh, coming out. Uh, Paul, you didn't say anything? Did, did, did you know anything about Harry Goodman? You're uh, muted, you. Paul, while you're muted. Yeah, I know a great deal about Harry Goodman. Actually, his... Uh... His uh, ooh, his son's stepson is the assistant rabbi here in one of the assistant rabbis here in Palm Beach, and uh, he was an interesting character. He was, yeah. Anyway, yeah, but he was one of these people. He wasn't a rough or anything. But no, so no. Agudas Yisrael, the real history which written will show. First, thing, I have to get into the archives. I tried right. to get into the archives years ago. They won't let me in. You need to get into the archives. There's been a good book. Like I just showed you that book. He got into the archives. It's, it shows a yeah. lot, but there's a lot more. And the back and forth, if we could ever really yeah. get the minutes of the Moetzis Gadolia Torah, as arguing about these matters, because yeah. you had the Hasidic Rebbe's, like from Sadegur and things that were basically Zionists. And the Ger Rebbe was pretty Zionistic. And then you had others who were really like anti-Zionist or non-Zionist, how they work these things out, and then with the German Orthodox, and, uh, you know, Mordechai Breuer declared in the 1960s, he says, there's no longer a place for us in the Aguda. There always was a place for the German Orthodox, and we founded it, but eventually it became so yeshivish that they don't even validate our lifestyle. So Aguda Sistral, it's a fascinating movement, a fascinating history. Yes, final comment, Nissen. Nissen, you're not, I can't hear you. Yes. You're muted, Nissen. Okay, I have a contribution about Harry Goodman. At, yes. the, at, the, at the Oh, okay. Speak. 
At the Shloshim Haskara of Rav Kalman Kahana, yeah. Rav, Schachter, Rav Schachter spoke, and our Ruv, the case marker Ruv uh, of the Poale Gooda Bar Park spoke. He had personally attended the uh, Aguda um, Kinesia Gadola uh, held immediately after World War II. And he recounted how Harry Goodman, that was the first time I heard the name. Harry Goodman spoke and said, we have to support the British government. We can't go against the white paper. And everybody, I could have mentioned everybody shuckling. Yeah, yeah. There was one young man, a young man from Eretz Yisrael, from the Yishuv. His name was Kalman Kahana. And he got up and he spoke against Harry Goodman, of course, and said how we all must get our brethren to come into Eretz Yisrael, no matter what the obstacles are. So that's how I heard of this Harry Goodman. I would add some more words, but we're being recorded, so I will stop. No, it's interesting, because he's an important Balabas, a very interesting and a good big Askan, but he was uh, pushing the anti-Zionist uh, endeavor at the same time that you had people like the Gare Rebbe in his circle that were going in a different direction. That's an inner Aguda fight. You've had that fight at the Kinesi and Marienbad between, we spoke about, Rabbi Hanan Wasserman and Ravon Cutler on the one side versus Rick Cyrilson and uh, you know, Hasidic Rebbe's on the other side. Aguda Sistral fought this battle out among itself, what to do. Uh, with the state. So, well, thank you all. Look, we can go on talking, talking with very interesting stuff. Uh, and I feel benefit. Oh, so many people who know so much uh, and the ones who write to me. So, shkoyach very much. And I guess you'd say final words, Rabbi Kelman. No, I don't. Any. I can't imagine the Metzikadoli Torah had minutes of their meetings. I don't know. I, I find that uh, <laughs> to find those minutes, they actually keep minutes. I don't know. I, don't I know, bet you the think. early That's ones when the Germans were running it did. The Germans, I'm sure, yeah, but I, no, I can't when believe they were in When the German Orthodox were running it, they definitely would have had minutes. Okay, that the I fact hear. that the Marienbach convention had the minutes. father was the secretary. I'm he told sorry. me himself, our Fabian Kimmel's father, he was the secretary. He has the minutes. Ask Rabbi Yoel. Rabbi where, Fabian where told me. Now? Who has the minutes now? I don't know, but he had the minutes. Rabbi okay, Fabian the is, had them the they're not supposed to have machokis. The gedolim are supposed to battle it out, and then they come to a decision, and then they're supposed to have a, uh, a united front when they issue their ruling. Like our, you know, our, uh, our Canadian cabinet, that's how the cabinet works in Canada. Hmm. They're not allowed to, they, they really are, they're not allowed to speak about all the uh, disputes they have in the Trudeau cabinet or any other cabinet. Well, it makes cabinet. sense, I get it. Uh, yeah, 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 there's yeah, a good yeah, reason that's, that's, for that. Yeah, okay, yeah. Anyway. thank you all. Okay, thank you. Okay, please God, see you next week. Everybody uh, be well. Tomorrow, Rabbi Shulman, of course, uh, class on Kohelet and all the regular classes during the week. Everybody uh, should have Laila Tov, Bissarot Tovot, and uh, look forward to learning with you. And as I keep saying now in the winter, our new sort of man, uh, please invite a friend to come and join us uh, who hasn't yet experienced all the wonderful classes uh, to our motion. So Laila Tov, everybody be well. Thank you very much. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye, Laila.